Let's oh, see. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I am just about ready. Okay. Mm. I didn't know if uh, you have But you can go ahead and uh, get the story. Okay. okay. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Katie Victor. I'm a fair new librarian here at Central. I just started last quarter. Um, Lynn and I are co facilitating these social issues conversations um, this winter while Kelly McHenry is away. Um, we love that people want to come into the library and talk about things that are happening out in the world um, and bring conversations into the library. The library is a place, um, our vision and mission of the library includes buying a collection that represents diverse viewpoints and starting a conversation that represents diverse viewpoints. So it's good when that can happen with real people um, and be live with students and instructors, etc. So um, today, Carl Livingston will talk on the topic of new directions in black history. He's published journal articles on the topics, um, actually published a book on the topic as well, and has been teaching here at Central for 23 years. Is that right? Yeah, 23. a long time. Okay. So, hey, um, hey, no whistling. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. So uh, I will probably uh, cut in at some point to to make sure that everyone in the audience has a chance to ask questions at the end. Great. About so, what time? About two hours <coughs> or what? Yeah. How do you feel about that? That sounds good to me. Good. Okay. Because I have been known to go long. Mm. Okay. So Don't welcome, me, Carl Livingston. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Spreading some books all around. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's still a little work in progress. It's a pretty broad topic area. I wanted to bring this to you uh, because I um, I have been taught by, influenced by those that have pushed this discipline. Uh, and I'll say some more about that. Oh, I just realized I'm about to miss an appointment. Hey, can I do something really quickly? I just got to tell somebody I made a mistake and I might want to be able to have lunch with him. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I better do that. Him. I just thought about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's 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 uh he's gonna be. Uh, I, I am so embarrassed right now. I am speaking. He's like, are you there at SCC? Hmm. Till this is so this is so tacky. This is, see, this, this is, is what's wrong down with the uh, right. You're like, what kind of lecture is this? Okay, uh, so. Um, well, at least I, I did tell him. Right, so that's just terrible. Okay, um, uh, so I've been influenced by students that, I was going to say forced me to learn this, and that's not quite right either. They didn't force me, but they put me in a position in which I was, I, I, I uh, was embarrassed by defending a uh, traditionalist position regarding uh, this information. And I started my own search. But let me explain it kind of this way. The purpose of the lecture today is to, uh, to let you know that a lot of college and university programs are languishing right now, black studies programs. But there are some large universities particularly where they're doing some great work. And it's not being done uh, often by African American professors. I mean, sometimes, you know, Quintard, Taylor, and others, a lot of, uh, uh, white, Asian, other professors doing some, some really good work. But I am most influenced and most intrigued by these Diopian, these Afrocentric Diopian, and these, believe it or not, got, got some, some non scholarly Atlantean scholars who's, in, who's, whose work is really interesting. And so I kind of want to tell you about that, see what you think about all of this. Um, okay, that's me, and yeah, I've been teaching there for a long time. I got this book out, Two Strings of Bootstrap, The Development Plan for Black American. I was asked to write that. Um, it's not really selling, and uh, I almost lost my house. It's just, I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> I'm working on another book that's not going to be only to Af mainly to African Americans. I'm excited about that, you know, because uh, I've had to just start giving the book away. And, uh, so I'm about 30000 into it, and uh, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't hear me. No, you didn't. And so, um, but I'm hoping to launch a movement. I'll give it away if it means launching a movement. It's a self-help plan. How you build a community. How you pick a community up. 
uh, how many can pick itself up by its own bootstraps? How others can help pick it up by its bootstraps? At least give it a shoestring. So the shoestrings should help you get from others. Bootstraps to help you get yourself. And uh, so that's what the book is about. And so if you hear about it, oh, and when it sells at the half price store for two dollars, I can't handle it. I have to buy it myself. I'm like, do you realize what this is? Uh, any, any authors know what I'm talking about? When you see your book being sold at a table for 50 cents, you like time out. There's something wrong going on up here. <laughs> Did you, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, yeah. and it hurts you. Then it hurts. <laughs> oh man. Okay, and again, I had to learn. I, I was taught uh, black studies in a more Afrocentric, the Ottoman way, by students that got me to go down to Blackbird Bookstore. That's where I was my start. It used to be up here on uh, Pike Street. And uh, Joseph Zimbabwe, he died uh, about 10, 14 years ago. But I started collecting the library. I started with Herodotus' histories. I went back to read it myself. Mm -hmm. Learned about Martin Bernal. A lot of these works you're gonna see on here. Then I got to know him through, at least telephonically, through a professor. Andrew Gillen he used to teach up here. And, uh, and I'm just wowed by what I started learning. And then I started thinking about how I was being educated. I kind of got an attitude about it. But we'll make some of those points in a little bit. All right, let's hit some terms. Black studies, an interdisciplinary field uh, of study devoted to the history, culture, and politics of black Americans. Africana studies study of the history, politics, and cultures of peoples of African descent in Africa and in the African diaspora. More and more things are moving. Uh, the the, the uh, universities are changing from black studies programs to Africana studies program. There's good and bad with that. The good thing is it's bringing in blacks in all of the diaspora and outside the diaspora. Uh, the bad with that is um, it's becoming very focused away from the African American experience here. And uh, it's accepting the fact that African American population at the universities is declining. And if it keeps going the way it's going, it's really not even going to be like Black Studies was when it first started, which is really a story of African American, the black experience here in this country. And it may not be a great. Um, uh, engine of intellectual uh, focus and perspective to help launch movements or to help inform movements already launched. So, you know, and, and then again, it may, may come around, hey, I can see that one's not even on the, then I gotta lift this up a little bit so you can read that last line. Well, it may have been I play with it, I might hit a button and then, you know, I'm not really tech savvy, so, you know, the most of you are, but I, let me just keep going. And then Afrocentrism, an ideology and perspective that centers on the heritage and history of ancient Africa and that condemns Eurocentrism. That's what that says. Condemns Eurocentrism. So the Afrocentrists, you know, they ain't messing around when it comes to um, pointing out uh, racism that exists and sometimes a little strident at, at that. I think I'm going to try that. See. No. See, I knew I let me just leave it alone. Is that all right? Because if I try to fix it, I'm gonna have to uh, destroy it. <laughs> all right, so I was gonna move it up so you guys see. Let's go now to ASCAC. I don't really have ASCAC in the presentation that exists right now because mm -hmm. I was still working on it. I was trying to get there. But um, when I started this school, I was not only influenced by students like Merciful and Truth that spent a lot of time up here, and I can't think of a lot of the women's names. They were coming out of uh, uh, Injuguna, I hope I said his name right, Tehuti. Um, I, they were not only coming from the middle college high school that we used to have here, the alternative high school that you couldn't call alternative high school, they didn't like that name. But they were also coming from Franklin's, <coughs> Franklin with uh, uh, Haley. Not Haley. Um, yeah, Haley. Anybody at Franklin? Or been to Franklin? 
<laughs> and then at Garfield, there used to be back in the 90s a teacher named Gary Davis. And then these students also were influenced by the Nation of Islam. And they're very distrustful of traditional scholarship. For, because of quotes I'm going to give you in just a second. And um, they came up in my classes. I know they were doing it in some of y'all's classes. And I talk about Greece, and I'm ready to keep it moving. Hit Greece a little bit so you can get some foundations thing. Keep it moving. I got concepts, terms, schools to teach you. And they'd be like, Professor, what about Egypt? In fact, Kevin, I'm sorry, I should have said Egypt. I'm like, don't bring that Black Panther stuff in here, young man. We're trying to learn something. After a while, shooting these students down, don't get me wrong. I thought, you know, what might be good is if I go get these works they're talking about, show them what wrong. So I went and got Francis Chris Wilson's ISIS papers. I wasn't very impressed with that. I went and got George G.M. James' Stolen Legacy. Went and got uh, Herodotus's History. I'm like, mm -hmm. Ran into Martin Bernal's Black Athena. Man, I started going through a transformation. Actually, when I was hitting, when I went to Herodotus' history, I was like, you know, you could at least taught me this was a minority school. <laughs> you could at least taught me that there were some scholars that believed. Is, and I started thinking about my own education. Every time they shut down Africa, anything African, you know, and I'm learning that stuff in the 60s at, in elementary school, in the 70s at the universities, in the 80s up at the, I'm sorry, the 70s, really the 80s up at the and uh, I, I was like, man, you know, they could have taught me that stuff in a way that gave more, more credence to, uh, to Africans and Africa and stuff. So anyway, here are the schools that I want to talk about. The Black Studies School or African, increasingly it's called the African American Studies Departments or something like that program. And the Africana Studies. Afrocentrism school, Ethiopian schools, Atlantean schools. Now, this, when you get to Afrocentrism, there, it's not like if you go look that up, you won't find it a discrete, separate school, and and all. They, this is mainly coming from a Malefi Asante at Temple University, but there are other scholars here and there that follow that, and um, and then Diop, that's coming from to, uh, a number of places, but mainly Dr. Leonard Jeffries coming from City University of New York, and they've been on him, uh, trying to take the money out of the program, trying to get rid of him. They don't like what he teaches. He does go a little too far at times, talking about whites as the ice people, who are colder, that's why they can do the, the things that they've historically done, and then you got the sun people, they got bigger, they're not bigger, but they're nicer, kinder. You know, we proof for that. His presentation of a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here is really good and profound, on, particularly on the minds of students. So he got a strong following of students that will rise up him. That's what makes this undercurrent of Afrocentrist and Ethiopian scholars really compelling because when they get a chance to speak to students, Man, you can hear a pin drop. Or actually, it's more than that. At times, they'd be like, yeah, high five, and then. So they, they come with so much power. They're even influencing now preachers and stuff. Preachers that come out of that Cone, James Cone tradition, more emphasis like uh, Jeremiah Wright up in Chicago, and even the Reverend Dr. Sam Berry Kenny up here. In, you, talk about, you talk about Jeremiah Wright in front of Reverend Dr. Sam Berry Kenny that just left Mount Zion. You got a problem, they're friends. They are of similar ideological bent. So these ideas are coming in through churches, black studies programs, some, through black bookstores. Black bookstores are a major repository of all of this stuff. Life enrichment books right now on Rainier Avenue. You know, they, 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 that's where you can get this stuff and talk these ideas. And again, when these scholars get to the students or they go up to the prisons, Shut it down. That's all they want to hear. Nation of Islam. On and on. All right, I, was, I, was, I just realized, too, that I didn't finish telling you about ASCAT, Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. When I first got up here, um, 
it wasn't just the uh, students, but it was teachers like Rosetta Hunter, uh, uh, Gilda Shepherd. They were like, hey, there's an ASCAT conference up at Evergreen. I was like, oh, what? Are you like, scoop up? Should have. And so next thing I know, I'm up at Evergreen. And they're, they're starting a San Hotel. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You heard this stuff before? Nobody, nobody keeps up with the five percenters, Nas, or anything. You're hearing about this stuff about Egypt being called Kemet. All that. So, okay, you're starting a little bit now. I'm trying to tell you, that's some of this DMV stuff. And so they will have, every five years or so, an ASCAT conference of an Evergreen. Oh, it's amazing. And Diop is the central scholar of the whole thing. So you got the deal. We'll talk about it in a little bit. All right. And then you got these Atlantians, man. They, they, they just, uh, I'll have to come back to this one because I haven't finished that chart. All right, here we go. Um, why study um, black studies anyway? Just before we go into what's happening with it, let me just say something about white studies. It's search for truth. It's search for truth. So, so we, we don't want to forget the fact that uh, you know you got some legitimate, serious-minded scholars that are teaching uh, black studies. They just want to know like anybody else wants to know. But it's also the correction of error. And the correction of error is a political thing. You would be amazed how much myth institutions hold on to and people in institutions. It's political. It's so political that the South Koreans are still trying to get the Japanese to admit the uh, Nanking massacre. It's so political that the Armenians are still trying to get the Turks to admit to what happened and, uh, and their massacre. It's so political that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm say, uh, the Ron's leader, is it Ackman I got to get his name right. You know, sometimes, if he wants to, it's slow to recognize the Holocaust. It's so political that if you go back to the Middle Ages, even though the scientists were saying we're in a heliocentric world, they were still saying Earth is at the center. It's so political that although there's an out of Africa theory, you will still have teachers teaching that humankind developed simultaneously in a few different places. And you have to force people sometimes, force teachers even, to teach the right thing. They have to hold on to old stuff that affirms them. You would be amazed at even how professors are on this kind of stuff. Especially if it speaks to something in them. Of every race, every ethnicity. But we're over here in a Western world, so a lot of this stuff is from a Eurocentric perspective. And these scholars are, these teachers are slow to get it up. It's so political that when Mark Bernal is writing his works, these works right here, no, not that one, this one, these, he's making arguments that the Egyptians influenced the Greeks. It's similar to what Herodotus said. And he's not just making bald claims. He's writing thick books, no pictures, two professors, a scholarly discussion. And those professors so disdain him that he told me on the phone, he's Jewish American, he's not black. Uh, the graduate students don't like to walk with me and be seen with me, or they don't get letters of recommendation from the other scholars. Mm. Oh, and this was happening in 2000, so like 2000, 2002, 2004. Come on, man. You have to force people to teach the right things. <clears throat> and I refuse. So if you're in my introduction to the science class, soon as we talk about Greece, I say, yeah, Greece is classical, man. Amazing and all that, but I refuse to stop there. So, at the risk of even a number of the white students' sensibilities in the class, I go, you know what? We got to spend a little time, though, saying that as we learn more, we're learning that in the Far East they have developed similar ideas that we developed over here, maybe similar that we did in other places. And I see students pull it back, but I, I just refuse to not say that and to bring some information because I remember when I was 
in those chairs. And every time I, every time he said Africa or anything, I'd write something in me like, whoa. And professors were very good at shutting all that down. Mm -hmm. I thought about the fact that I was a child, I was a kid, and I deserved better than that. That affected me. It makes me angry. I have to catch my emotions from the back. Uh, but you know, part of me wants to fight about that. Part of me wants to cry. Because I was a child, I needed that information. It would help me learn. It would help me learn. And I thought about how consistently my professors shut that down closed that door, reminded me it's a dark continent from which, uh, let's, check, let's check out some quotes. Here's some quotes, here's the United States Supreme Court. This is where we came from. This is why we need black studies. It's difficult to this, this day to realize the state of public opinion in regard to that unfortunate race which prevailed in the civilized and enlightened portions of the world at the time of the Declaration of Independence when the Constitution of the United States was framed and adopted, but the Public history of every European nation displays it in a manner too plain to be mistaken. They have for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order. And so far inferior, they had no rights which a white man was bound to respect. That's where we came from. These things push some students to the forefront and make them feel large, and it, in, it, it inwardly kills others. Wow, that's crazy. So I memorize those things, teach those to my children. I don't push them too much up here. This is a little teeny bit, but my children have to know where we came from because the vestiges remain as they explain how the Egyptians couldn't have understood very much because they were very abstract in their reasoning. I'm sorry, they weren't very abstract. They were more concrete. And when I hear that language, something bristles in me and I get real close to just saying something to mess up the whole presentation. Or Wallace Budge in 1894 in a book that was reprinted in 1989, the Egyptian Aborigines are thought by some to have been a dark-skinned race and to have belonged to the Negro family. Whatever may be the truth of these points, it is pre pretty clear that no traces of their works or buildings have come down to it. Nothing. They give you nothing, nothing. Uh, 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 and as schools belonging to their time have not been found, any statement as to their race characteristics will be based on pure assumption. Uh, about the race to which the Egyptians known to us from mummies and statues belongs and its characteristics, there is no doubt whatsoever. I can show you the book. Is that what that says? There is no doubt, and on to the next page, there's no doubt who brought race into it. So who brought race into it? I go to fix it, and they go, there you go talking race. That is so convenient. There is no doubt whatever. He was a Caucasian, and it would seem he came to Egypt from an original home in Asia around the mountains they call Caucasus. So, it's for these kinds of reasons. These things remain, and you have to work hard. This is a book. I gotta go find it now, but it came out of our library here in Seattle Central. I just use it when I'm talking about how great Greece is, because Greece was fantastic. I don't need to pull Greece down. Greece was amazing. But can you deconstruct some of this stuff with me? Look how we teach this. Between 500 BC and 500 AD, two extraordinary civilizations. Greek and Roman came to flower in the Mediterranean world. Their influence upon the humanistic tradition was both profound and long-lasting and far exceeded. That of any culture that preceded, far exceeded. That's how we teach it. Mm -hmm. And when they get through squeezing out this definition, they leave you hardly nothing for the Chinese, ancient Chinese, ancient Indian. When they get through parsing this thing out, there's nothing hardly left. This is around 1980. You can read the rest of it. It occurs to me it's also very Christocentric. And, it, and that may be a lot of the motivation, too. That uh, Christianity adopts, adopts, 
adopts Greek and Roman thought, and so the African thought was always anathema to Christianity. Yeah, but it need not even be what you're saying. It might it, that might be a part of it, but it's not. That's not what propels. I don't think that's what propels that. I think what's what right. There's an added factor that would explain why it perpetuates itself and why it's so hard to get rid of. It's, it's, it's yeah. reaching people on multiple levels. Of it, it, that's true. That's true. It's very nationalistic. It's very. It's it just feels good. It's very. I mean, when you get done with that, you just go. Ah, unless you are of a different ethnicity. All right, this is Carter G. Wilson. When you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. You don't have to tell him not to stand or go yonder. He will find his proper place and stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there's no back door, he'll make one. And sit there. That's, education is powerful. To educate, one of the meanings means to draw out. And you just will not be drawn out. You just won't be drawn out. You'll be transmogrified. You'll be made like into something that's very different from what you could have been. And so that's why I think some type of specialized, discrete studies are needed. Women's studies and, and, and Asian American studies. These things are search for truth and they force us to look at our assumptions and the things that we say because we, we're tough about holding on to our sexism. We're really, we're really aggressive about holding on to our classism and our westernism and all of this kind of stuff. So it challenges us and our elitism. You start like, what did I just hit? What did I do? I hit media center? Is that what I hit? Yeah. Okay, somebody might have to come up here and say, still, just hit that, do that right there? No, no, it's still up there. It's just, uh, but I can get rid of that. Can yeah, I? get rid of it. Can, can I just hit that? Yeah. 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 Woo! I'm telling you, in my class, they like, listen, relax. We can help you. Take a computer class. I'm like, I ain't got time. I ain't got time. They're like, this is so embarrassing. Okay, let's go into now these schools. Here you got the black and American study, African American study schools. Um, some larger programs are doing really good work, particularly these multi ethnic faculty. You can look these folks up. I mean, so, so, some great research is being done. Let me just point, though, uh, out Quintar Taylor. He, he does some fantastic research on African Americans in the West. How many of y'all caught the series on PBS? Yeah. Not PBS, but on the, the like the University of Washington station, mm -hmm. I think it is. Uh, and, but I want to point out some of these non-black faculty, because the truth of the matter is, I wish black faculty would do a little bit more early research on things. And I know some of them are doing it. Uh, there's a guy named Ryonoko Rashidi that you probably have never heard of. And he's kind of more, he's sort of, what do you mean? He's kind of, he's an ASCAT person, Association of the Study Class for African Civilization. And just on his own dime, he just keeps traveling, different continents doing, continents doing original research on the African presence, like he's got one now in Europe, the African presence, early African presence in Asia. You know, he goes to China, he asks questions, he goes to, I love that. But it's costing him everything. It costs him everything. He has no life. Because he's trying to give you a new understanding of truth. He has no life so that he can, he just can't stop. He can't stop it. When he comes out here, I know he needs money to make it. And I'm sad that I can't pull out more for him because I'm like, go, man, go, go. But some of these white professors, now basically this is dead. This dude was just, you gotta get his videos. I, I just, he, he was in the army in uh, World War II, and he looked up, how many of y'all know this story? He looked up at the Sphinx, and he's from England, and he looked at the Sphinx and he went, my God, <laughs> he's a Negro. <laughs> <laughs> and it started his questioning, and he became <coughs> such a sensitive, a wonderful scholar that one of the West African nations just made him an honorary chief, and when they, which is, I should say, king. And when they'd have their celebration in West Africa, he'd be on the golden stool, 
with the gold around it. They, they got some gold. That's the, that's the reason why it's called the gold gold. And they be dancing and Mark Bernal trying, I mean, uh, Basil Davis trying to get his groove on like everybody else. Love this thing, man. And, and Douglas Massey's work on American apartheid and housing discrimination. At first, I, I didn't understand it. As a kid, say, I wasn't feeling it. And then I started really figuring out how to apply it. And I realized, bam, it popped. That's how I should explain discrimination after slavery. Always start with housing as discrimination. Then explain the other types because it all spun off of housing discrimination. And he just gets up there and brings it. Man, I wish I would have had also here, if I can remember his name, um, uh, two, two nations, uh, separate, unequal, what's that guy? Hacker? Huh? Hacker? Hacker. I should have put his name up here. These are non-black professors that are amazing. Um, um, Takaki, Ronald Takaki, just died. Oh man, I mean to tell you, it just, oh man, I, I, James Lowen, James Lowen just came up with this book right here. Where's Sundown, where's Sundown Town? 2000 and like uh, uh, eight, nine, something like that. Yeah, who, who's read this? My daddy was telling me about this stuff, making oxtails too, but he couldn't prove it. But my dad used to say, you know what? There were towns that you couldn't go into when the sun went down. When the sun went down, you had to kick, take your old behind that. This guy wrote the book named one of them in Washington State. When the sun went down, no, two of them, Richland and Kimmy, by federal order. And he says Illinois and Indiana, Indiana were the worst. Some of them had signs. Oh, you ought to read the first paragraph. It begins with Anna, Illinois. First paragraph, that's what I do. I take this book. Yeah, and this dude, looked, he just looked like a Mormon, like a, that's why I love this dude. He wrote a book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, or something like that, right? This dude starts his book with Anna, Illinois. Anna stood for Ain't No Niggas Allowed, Illinois. Wow. A train whistle blew, and all the maids, porters, and everybody had to get going across the railroad track. He just breaks it down. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, Martin Bernal. And, uh, you know, I've had a chance to speak to him on the telephone. All right. But it's still languishing. I can't show you everything that I want to because I didn't spend too much time on the front end. But this one right here, uh, this sister, uh, Naliwe no, no, Rooks, has been talking about the crisis in higher education. And she's got this audio right here, but I, I just think I'm going to run out of time if I play it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is basically saying that. Uh, when these programs launched, they didn't really, they, there was a group of, of, of uh, influential political people that tried to get in front of the launching of the black studies programs in the country. <coughs> because they were concerned that it would be an, like an engine of development for liberation. And they wanted it to be a, just a certain thing because they know the power of education and they knew that with all the, Martin Luther King getting killed and all this stuff going on, you gotta give them something. So you better jump ahead and do it and made sure that when these programs launched, they were real traditional, as traditional as people can make them. And, and so they weren't these, these areas of liberation. And then since then, they, they just beggar the programs. They make it a type of a ghetto at the university. They make it hard to get professors full time to work in the area. Mm -hmm. They give the most credence to the ones that are the most traditional and make sure that they're not Afrocentric and all that. And at the end of the day, it's, it's almost like killing them. Um, then this guy right here, Cecil Brown, he talks about the, um, the, I, I ain't gonna try to fix it, because if I fix it, I know something, if y'all can fix it on my system, but he wrote this book right here, dude, where my black studies department? <laughs> it talked about the disappearing African Americans at the college, the universities, particularly African American males, and how the, the, as those numbers go down, there's, there's less of a justification to even put money in the program. And, uh, and he talked about how they're already shifting and stuff to other areas anyway. And um, so he's, he's, he's got that. He calls it the Disappearing Act. And, um, and you can read that. And I'll make this PowerPoint available. I'll give it to one of our, uh, the, the librarians, and uh, they'll take it from there. We got a great, uh, great library staff. So, all right, let's go to this Africana study. Um, Africana, it just, it's different from black studies in that it focuses more on the diaspora. <clears throat> and that's a good thing. Like I said, it's good and bad, though. 
and uh, and they're a little bit more radical. Now they're going to make a little bit more room for Afrocentrists and for the, these Diopians, right? And so then follow Sheikh after Diop, who died in 86, and what he taught. And I'll say a little bit more on that in a little bit if I get some time where you guys can ask me questions, and I'll get into your questions. And this James Turner guy kind of explains it by putting it like in four stages. Um, and so, let's see if I can get all that. No, it's Robert Harris that puts it in four stages. This James Turner guy was like the first one that used, it, used the term Africana studies and stuff. And he was kind of foundational in his work with that. And that's kind of the direction. That's that's one way that Black Studies program can go, but the more they go that way, the more their schools aren't going to like them. And probably even less resources they're going to get. For instance, you can look at what happened to Malefi Asante at Temple as a cautionary tale. Malefi Asante started getting influenced by the Diopians and said, you know what, I ain't even calling ours black studies, I ain't even gonna call it Africana studies. When you called in, they would go, hello, comedic studies. Because they wanted to use the word for Egypt, and it's so Egypt-centered, that's probably a mistake too, but it's so ancient Egypt-centered. And they called themselves Kemet, and KMT stood for the black land, and the black scholars said, all right, because the Nile used to rise up and leave that dark So it's because they were dark. They were swarthy, they were dark, they were sun washed and bathed. That's why they made the Sphinx so, with so much prognathism and so Central African. That's why they made Osiris or Asar so dark. If they couldn't paint him black, they painted him blue. How many of y'all took getting on somebody and said, you're so black, you blue? Remember <laughs> how we do it? But that was a negative because we are so Eurocentric in our Right, so to be black is to be ugly. So that's how we use that. But they use that as beauty. And so when they say KMT, and the glyph for it is a piece of charcoal, that's how they would start these ASCAT conferences and all that. That's how he wanted to answer the telephone. Well, other professors heard about that, and they were like, what is going on down? We are not paying for that. <laughs> and man, they came after the left of Sunday. They're like, we want your job. Because you're the one that does it. We're not teaching for you to we're not paying this department for you to teach it that way. He was like, this, this, is, this is where the truth is, this is where the field is taking me. This is what my students want. Well, that ain't what we're paying for. <laughs> and he's a cautionary tale, and then what happened to Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, a cautionary tale. You know, they, just brought, they tried to get Jeff, Jeffries' job up in Kuhn. All right, so Africana studies is a way, but they gotta be careful. But the group that's gotta be careful the most are the Afrocentrists, and this is a Malefi Asante, and he's the one that has developed really Afrocentrism. This is one of his more recent books, but he got a book called Afrocentrism. I think that's what it's called. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, Lucia, that's some of his, no, no, that's Frank, sorry. Uh, maybe I don't have Afrocentrism, huh. Oh, here it is right here, Afrocentricity, Malefi Asante. And he's developing a whole new culture, really. He's saying for African Americans, you gotta go back to go forward. You've got to go and we got to remake some things from uh, Africa, but mainly East Africa. It makes some of the West Africans go, why are you leaving us out in the South Africa? But the reason why they go East is because of those great uh, Egyptian civilizations and, and that's what they want to be focused on and, and emphasize. And that's what they say, you're going to get your greatness. Uh, and so there's uh, Leonard Jeffries. He came up here and uh, black students wanted him. He came and spoke in the 90s up there on 14. Shut it down, man. I mean, it was packed up there. And he spoke amazing. And you could just see this relationship between him and the audience and the students. That other professors can't touch. Once you let these Diopian professors get up here and they start talking, first thing they say is hotel. They start teaching them ancient Coptic and Egyptian words. That means the, that's the word for peace. And it comes to and they say, talk back to me. They say, hotel. And say, I shave. Things like that. And they start telling, they start telling you come from a victorious path. But they're like preachers. When they get done, these students are like, yeah. Some of them with GEDs and all that. They're like, can I get this book? They want to read this stuff at home. They want to start a sales group. You didn't tell me that's who I was. And they probably are making some ex. They, they, they're going a little too far on some things. But man, they'll have people with sixth grade education read, memorizing stuff, coming back, challenging it. They're like, man, you putting my brain back in my head. I'm coming alive. 
I don't believe in lies no more. So you have to be very careful when you go after people like that. And that's what I think is going to be the undercurrent that's going to change black studies, African, African American studies, whatever you want to call it. I think this group is so strong that nothing's going to stop them over time in their students. Because there's so many quotes out there that you could already get of traditional scholars teaching that you were close to the beasts, or that African Americans were close to beasts, that it causes them to get very distrustful, to be very distrustful of scholarship. And then they're so slow to accept things, even Bernard's research, they just fighting him all the way. Uh, you know, this one was fighting him. This was one of the first, uh, Lefkowitz and others. Saying, oh no, watch out, Bernal's putting a Malcolm X hat on, on the Rogers. 60 Minutes show was done on it. Man, Bernal said he went to a depression. They were hitting him from so, so many different sides. But guess who was his, his main backup? Black Studies programs in places like Temple. Shoot, man, they were paying this dude to come speak. And then their class assistants and others that were going, Bernal, this is myth and you don't need to live. Man, they were like, say so. You know, you have to come. Like, hey, man, just, just knowledge, don't. Quit fighting. No, man, because he's teaching truth. And we, shoot, I'm telling you, let these Diopians come. They come with a whole different set, man. These dudes, some of them just got through selling weed and yeah. they're up there hustling and gang banging. And they're like, man, we put all this stuff down to get some knowledge. And then we got to go back out there and bang because this society ain't open to us anyway. But these not, these are the ideas we want to hear. This is the stuff that informs the five percenters and Nas and other people like that that are talking about what you came from. What are they arguing? You're the cradle of civilization. You're the cradle of humanity. All humanity came from Africa. Are they arguing? You're the cradle of civilization. All the exact sciences and all knowledge came from Africa, especially on the, the Nile spine. All civilization. That's what they're saying. Hey, I think they go too far because you can't prove that. You don't have to prove that. Just prove that what they said about Greece is wrong. That all knowledge comes from Greece. That you're a citizen. Eurocentric, but don't be given to a new type of over a new type of excess. Because when that later gets corrected, even if it takes a hundred years, it discredits a lot of what's been said. You don't have to go that far. Just stay with truth. Okay. So um and that's a good place to stop and get some questions, right? And so um and, and I think I'm pretty and, and let me just say something about these Atlanteans. And then I'll and then I'll stop. Why I'm so intrigued with these Atlantis? These Atlantis are half crazy to me because some of them were influenced by Edgar Casey and others, and they've been looking for the mythical Atlantis, but they got money. <laughs> they can get money. So guess what they've been doing? Who's the they? People like Robert Boval, uh, an engineer. People like um, they went and got Robert Shop, a geologist from Boston University. They showed Jock, uh, the shock, he didn't have his tenure yet when they showed him this in the 90s. It's, they just covered up the head of his face. He said, just look at the body. Doesn't it look like it was water damage? <laughs> so I said, yeah, it looks like the typical water damage. Then he just pulled the top off and went to He went, oh, no. And then he said, they said, man, just get in an airplane, fly up there, and do the studies. Don't, don't come with preconceived notions. We, want to, we think we can prove that the Sphinx is twice as old as they say it, twice as old. It goes back to a time period where there's supposed to be no civilization up there, just march. He does studies, man. This guy goes to the geology, he goes to the geologist annual conference and presents a paper on it. That's how you're supposed to do it. But he waited till he got tenure, because listen, I'm telling you how political this is. <laughs> you make these arguments, it costs you to. You make these arguments, people don't want to walk with you. you you'd be like, come on. This is the 2000s. But that is the way it is. Because when people see themselves in history and knowledge, they will then just say, that's just history and knowledge. And I don't care what their ethnicity is. And you have a hard time divesting them of some of their illusions so you can talk about truth even if it's killing the minds of some people. And you make that excess as an African American. And you can make it as a European American. You can make it as a person from China. It doesn't matter where you come from. We regularly need people to tap us on the shoulder, pull our coat and say, hey, why not? 
it had gone too far. It had gone too far. We're all like that. We're all giving to it. You and I do it. You close the door. You start talking to your kids. I don't want you acting a fool out there. Well, Tommy does. <laughs> well, we ain't. You ain't Tommy. And in this house, we got some class. We are not like those other. If you keep going with that, you start sounding like. And you, so there's something special about us, and I want you to know it. Keep going with that, and you start sounding like the same people. I mean, there's something innocent and good about it, right? Then you, then you don't only teach your kid. Now you're starting to teach Tommy when he come over something special about us. Tommy's over there eating, going, I'm just glad to be. Well, I guess there is something special about you. You just messed up Tommy. Go ahead and ask me some This one is on the Sphinx in the ancient Egyptian society, probably being twice as old as you think it is. The latest one is called Black Genesis. Where is it at? This came out last year. This one's amazing. It had found a little stone head in the desert. In the desert that goes back to like 5000 BC and it's in the southwestern corner of Egypt where people thought there was no way you could have a society. Now they're going into southern Libya. Deep in desert dunes, man, dangerous driving. Who? These crazy Atlantean scholars. I don't know where they get this money from. <laughs> And some of them are letting this Atlantean stuff go. They say, I ain't worried about Atlantis now. They're going under the water and studying some of this stuff. The University of Washington will have Graham Hancock speak every four years or so. I try to check him out. I don't know where they're getting it from, but what they're doing is they're pushing the body of knowledge and they're making ancient civilizations, heritage come alive. They're pulling out of the doldrums, out of the, the dustbin, and out, of, out from underneath the ground. And when black study scholars hear about this, they're like, come speak, don't mess with them. Say something. Because they're like, I'm trying to find my heritage. OK, now, let me take questions now. Well, I have a question, but I want to make sure. It, are there students who have questions? Because I really want to hear it. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> yes. I have one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess the things you went through, like growing up in school, and then kind of just batting yeah. down uh, you know, yeah. your heritage, do you feel it? I mean, do you see kind of the same resemblance with like what they're doing, like Latino studies, like in Arizona? Exactly. And actually, even African Americans have to be careful because there's a great scholar we've had. He spoke at this school, Ivan Van Sertland. He was talking about the ancient African presence in the Americas. And he had some Mexican Americans go, hey, partner, you mess with our heritage. Why can't he just be Mexican? And I care about partners like that. But for the most part, it's against your centrism, and they're slow to recognize the greatness of Mexica, Aztec, Incans, Mayans. And uh, you gotta get up and you gotta argue for your heritage, man. You gotta, you gotta press political, you gotta press your way. But the great thing is there were some whites that will stand up with you. I, I showed you Basil Davis and the rest of them. They will stand up with you. It's that majority of the stuff. And some of them up here, you would think that they're more open-minded. Most of them that I know up here, I'm close to their offer of mine. But they will fight you. You have to go fight for your heritage. And there are some meetings you're going to get into with uh, some students that consider themselves. They say, where are you from, man? They say, man, I'm from Oslo. <laughs> they'll have that stuff, but shh, woo, you come up in them meetings, they learn it their way with an attitude. It looked like African Americans at an ASCAT conference, some of them students. They're militant about learning about Oxlon, about their heritage. You ever heard of what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. You ever heard of any of it in the rap? Yeah, some of it's in the rap too, in the Latino rap, Chicano rap. And there are groups in this country scared of it, like Buchanan, and, and, and that's what the students talking about. Watch out for these groups trying to take back their stuff and, and watch out for the African Americans. That's what, um, I can't find everything that I want to find here. <laughs> Uh, this is what Schlesinger was talking about. Schlesinger and Huntington got together and said, watch out for these ethnic groups. Trying to, they're trying to move us away from Europe. So in just trying to find your own heritage, you are a threat <laughs> to others that want you to be very, very focused, very, very Eurocentric. So it's kind of tough, dude. Good question. Yep. Yeah. Oh, who? Who? What's up, man? So, so what do you think is the central along the lines of uh, a lack slash languaging uh, black cultural studies? 
Oh, we look like a, we, we experience ourselves as very forward thinking on these things and very out front, but we, we are, we're very, we're right in the middle. And with the new people in place, I ain't just talking about the president, I'm talking about every, at every level. We've moved back a little bit. And it's probably gonna cost me saying that. I, I, I've already had my job on the line times up here. But we've moved back in some ways. Now, some of that was because of some excesses too that we did that made some groups feel like, man, if you ain't African American up here and just saying certain things, you get discriminated against. But, uh, and we don't want to be a part of discrimination. We, we've had that and done that. And we're, so if anybody says that to us, that should matter. We should go so. That should matter. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is we have, we're not as forward thinking as we, are, as we think we are. The fourth floor used to be the exemplar for the whole school. And math and science, business, those were some tough areas to bring the change. The fourth floor now is a lot different. Uh, we got a wonderful library. This is a very open place where you talk about a lot of different things. Uh, so if we may need a library to lead us. <laughs> okay, we may need a library to lead us, Ramiro. Yep. So, so on your comment about discrimination is not the way to go. Uh, right. That's, that's, I'm that's, serious about that. That's, that's not even ever been an option. That's not even been no, a way it's worked out because right now the larger society. Because because I truly believe that there needs to be a new black power movement. Yep. But one of the first reactions that I get from people is that it's it's it should be more inclusive. But yep. but the thing about this is that there has there hasn't been a movement, whether it's civil rights, whether it's uh, uh, the feminist movement, whether it's the gay rights movement, yep. that didn't call for allyship. You know, yep. so so it's not a matter about discrimination or, or or not allowing other people in. It's just that it's about standing in solidarity. I just want you to know, in smaller ways, we can be racist, sexist, discriminatory too. And I, 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 owe, I owe a white kid named Robbie apologies. Because when I was coming up, you know, it was one of the only white families in the hood. And with the anger that we had, we beat him up on a number of occasions and terrorized. Wait a minute, maybe, maybe it wasn't so much him. I played with him, but there was another white family. That's the example of like terrorism. And sometimes in black hoods, it's like this. So wherever we're powerful and we influence the institutions, and it seems to be small areas. Oh, we can be very racist, too. So we have to be checked, and we have to remind our own selves that we have to be the example. You see, I'm not saying that we're the cause of the problem. It's the majority that's the cause of the problem. But I'm also saying that we can be racist, too. Yeah, but, but I doubt you can point to any particular uh, time in American history, at the very least, where... where yeah, the big where, picture. Where, where black, yeah, the big right. picture. Where but black I gave you my example. See, but where black people... Right. Uh, lynch white people where black people dress up in hoods and burn crosses in front of people. But I'm just saying, I know black white people, people that bond, bond churches. You'll not, you'll not be able to find anything like that. But so you're gonna so find you, white so people that would beat up in black neighborhoods. So, so you beat up, so you beat up a couple, of, so you beat up a couple white kids. That's 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 not right. And right, I'm not saying wrong. that's right. That's but, what I'm saying. But compared compared to the black people, oh, it doesn't compare. I mean, yeah, oh. there, there's a distinct, oh, yeah, there's yeah. a distinct power dynamic in that, right. which, which which I don't think. Right. I don't think exactly. But, but back to the to the idea of discrimination. Like I said, there has not been a movement that didn't say we need allies. We Correct. need other people to get involved. We need Very you to true. stand with us because this affects you as well. So, Very true. so in calling for another black power movement, it's not about us discriminating against everyone else. It's everyone thinking that we're discriminating against someone calling it simply a black power movement. It's their insecurities, they're not ours. And we need a fucking movement. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Uh, yep, yep. I also do just want to say it's five to. Can we keep going for a little bit? Yeah, I definitely. But if people uh, have to go other places, okay. that's fine. Feel free to do so. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to add on to um, mm -hmm. where you're mm -hmm. saying music um, that we use as a, uh, a movement for social awareness and history mm -hmm. awareness. Uh, I think okay. what we said. Um, No, but I need you guys to help me because on arguments like, I mean, on points like this, I want to be able to come with that. So you got to go, ooh, I didn't know that. So y'all got to help me with your music. I only know about Nas right now. They're like, man, Nas is getting old. Nas is. I actually, he's not. I still bring your knowledge to you. What now? Actually, he's not. 
He's not? No. He's constantly bringing out a suit. Oh, okay, do okay. Okay, hey. But y'all you, you help me. You help me with that, okay? So I can put it in the lecture. Right. And I, and I also wanted to say, um, what do you think about schools? Because when I was growing up, I went to a school called Science Press. Yeah. Uh, preparatory academy. Yes. Um, what, do you feel that there is a depth and lack of those schools? And yep. what do you think the effects um, of those schools were? You know, it made, like, those I, I know, things. but there's a lot of people. It made a difference. Right. Those are good things. Now, uh, they got to do them right. So they got to teach you the stuff that you need to know so when you get back in the regular system if you have to, you do well. And sometimes they fail a little bit on that. But the good thing is, they're gonna teach you about your heritage. They're gonna teach you about your heritage. Now, that gives me a chance to make a point about historically African-American schools. Howard and all that. They're not teaching this stuff that much in an open uh, Afrocentric way because they're just trying to be Harvard and Yale and the University of Washington. And they're struggling to get resources. And most of them were founded by white. So they were already in a situation in which it was, it was tenuous every year for them to survive. And uh, they don't want to be that avant-garde. They're afraid of messing up their income stream. So in the places where you would think, oh, they're going to be all over this, they're going to be doing cutting edge research and all that stuff, huh? They are reticent. In fact, to, to, to stand out. In fact, this book that attacked Mark Bernal right here, and I shouldn't say attacked him, because when you come up with novel ideas like that the Egyptians have influenced the Greeks, you got to defend that, because they come in for you, and that's just the way the game is played. They used one black professor from Howard University named Snowden to say the Egyptians were not black. All man, to say the Egyptians were not black. Boy, he better be careful about coming up to some of these meetings that I'm in with some of these folks, he would get hurt. <laughs> but when asked about it, he said he was not black. He's half black, half white. So a lot of times people speak from their center. You speak from where your place, your location. So that's, but I'm saying he came from Howard. You would think nobody went from Howard would make an argument like that. Well, if you go there, you might find it to be a little different. There was another hand somewhere. Yeah. So I know that um, you're talk you were talking about like what is being taught and how they don't really want to teach the whole story. Yeah. Um, do you think that a, lo a lot, especially within the black community, they don't, they're choosing not to want to, they're choosing not to, so they don't want to know. Most of them don't want to go to college. They barely want to graduate high school. They just want to maybe go to the NBA, the NFL, and become a rap star whatever, video, whatever, mm -hmm. most of them don't want to know about their, about their heritage. So can, can we really say that it's, it's um, <coughs> well now, they don't want to teach it or is it, we just don't want to be um, I don't know what the new hierarchy of needs rubric is, but when I came up it was Maslow's mm -hmm. hierarchy of needs. And at the bottom is survival. Some of what we're talking about, learning about your hearing job, all that, is in the middle, so you can get to the top, your self-actualization. Go look that up, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what am I trying to say? When you're hungry, it can make it hard for you to read a book. When you're trying to scrape, and that's where we are. That's where the black masses are. We're the last hired, the first fired, as Reverend Dr. Sam Barry McKinney says, and I'd like to add a little bit to it, we're the last, the least, the lost, the left out, the locked up, and the locked down. But how much of that are we doing That to affects our your ability to teach your story mm -hmm. and to want to learn about what is out there to be that's being taught. So, but when you can get African Americans in a place where they kind of even have healed, and you teach this stuff, don't let them get to the Ethiopian scholars. Mm -hmm. And they access it. I'm telling you, it is riveting. We've had some of them up here where the, the bell rings and they don't want to go nowhere. They're like, we ain't leaving. When are you coming back? I want to know more. Oh, it's intense. It's like water on the desert. They're like, I need more. So, so I'm saying, uh, meet people's partial needs so that they can think a little bit. And I don't care if they got a third grade education. You'll be amazed at their 
uh, they, they'll want to, to learn. And then get them a teacher that'll teach it in a way that galvanizes them. And you'll see a part of them come out that will make you go, I'm a, I, I didn't know it was in. I've seen teach, I've seen some, oh man, some 19 year old women up here, back in the 90s particularly when we had some of these folks, with their kids on welfare still, just maybe coming off the street from tricking and stuff. And they're up here to learn that the baby's still eating oatmeal and drinking Kool-Aid, if that. But mama's so turned on and motivated, they're doing all right. She knows she's getting ready to go something now, go somewhere now. And guess what, it's Friday, Friday and instead of going to the club, she, she got her face in the club. It can happen, it happens. Some of the prisons, some of the smartest people you ever want to find are in the prisons. And if you go up there and talk to them, they will blow you away. Their questions, if you don't answer them right, they'll tell you, that answer ain't no good. I've already read this and that and that. You'd be amazed. Go back and go through the academic record, drop down to 10th grade. I, I want to add something about <laughs> that, um, that if scholarship is in fact Eurocentric and mm -hmm. it starts that way from preschool and kindergarten, then it would make sense that people who don't attach to a Eurocentric ideology also mm -hmm. don't attach to being in school and staying in school. Yeah. And that persistence through education, I mean, you have to, there is this process of opening up in education and kind of lighting a fire and lighting curiosity in people. And if it doesn't happen for African American students early on, I mean, it, it might be a reason. <laughs> they I don't, wish I had said that. that. They don't keep in high school and they don't want to go to college. Yep, yep. I, I, I guess it's just hard for me as a, as a black woman <laughs> knowing my history and I haven't even went into the deep as um, they're going I just know where I, where I come from and but I haven't I you know I was very blessed and I lived in a middle class neighborhood and I was fine but I I also know the importance of education and I know that there were slaves who had way less that were, weren't yeah. considered people that knew that it was important for me yeah. to be okay and I just get frustrated with my own people because I'm like yeah, I do too. They did. They did this, so you could you could you could know this. They don't need. They didn't even know it. They did it so you could. So yeah, I have. But but also, I I mean, I understand. I know all about the achievement gap and how it's played um a role in for a long time. And I you know I understand that if you're in a certain situation that it's hard and you don't want to care about education. But yeah, yeah. I, I guess how do you make them care? How do, you, how do you get yeah. people to understand that this is about you? Yeah, so sometimes, you? sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we can be hard-headed, <laughs> and sometimes we can be um, our own worst enemy and lazy, and so in those situations, you gotta stand back, you gotta let life beat people up a little bit, but they'll get, they'll hit a time where you can reach them. Some people you can reach a little bit, some people you can reach a lot, some people you can overwhelm with stuff. And they're like, more, 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 more. And when we're being lazy, like when I see that in my brothers and some others, I don't give them a pass. I'm like, man, what's wrong with you? Why don't you want to know? I don't care if you don't like it. You know, so I challenge them. And uh, so, who's next? I think it's oh. by the window. Terrell. Yeah. Uh, Terrell. Hey, hey, he's a teacher. This, you can learn a lot from this man over here. He's been through some things. He can identify with y'all, too. He can identify with you, too. Go ahead, man. Uh, I, I do understand your frustration with men and them not being motivated. But sometimes they don't have that much motivation. Yeah. They look outside, and they don't have nothing. So they're yeah. trying to survive every day. Yeah. And then when they get to prison, what they do is they read because they don't have anything else to do. Yeah. That's their survival mechanism. Yeah. So yeah. when they get in there and all they have is books, that's what they're going to do is read yeah. books. And then they get so educated and then they wonder why they couldn't have did it out here in the world. Yeah. But sometimes they're, they're, they're a product of their own environment. Yeah. You know, you, you go out outside. I have kids now that think that that's all they have to do is survive out here in the street. They don't know that there are better things to come because no one showed them better things to come. Yeah. You know, like, they don't have a whole lot of examples of men. Like, me personally, 
out of all my family members, all the men in my family, none of them went to college. And yeah. all of them are dying from alcoholism and diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's the truth. Yeah. So I had to take a, a real good look at myself and, and my family and all of that good stuff and choose whether I wanted to do it or not. It's a hard choice. I came from almost nothing. And I, I got a little bit of something and I'm blessed with it. Yeah. And I don't want nobody else to go through anything that I went through, even though mine wasn't that bad. But it's, it's hard to, when they don't get their education and they don't know how powerful they are as men, yeah. 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 it's hard for them to say, I'm powerful, I'm confident enough to do it because they haven't seen so many examples. You guys helped me, do, you helped me launch a development week. You helped me launch a development week. In my book I say it should start the Monday after Martin Luther King's holiday. We're gonna focus on development. Can I add to what you said? Yeah, can, can, I, can I finish this point? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to say something. On this development week thing, I thought I was saying something. Yeah, you didn't took all my little energy and stuff. I'm saying to you, that if you help me launch development in 10 years, you will see. He's true. And all this stuff we're trying to do, you're gonna have a better platform to do it. And it's gonna build some momentum in the community and people gonna feel like hey, something's happening. And in every area, I don't care if I make no money, I just wanna see the movement. But when your money's jacked up, it really affects your ability to help yourself. When your money's jacked up, it affects, you can fall into pathologies. You know, there's more domestic abuse when your money start getting funny. You know, when you got a little bit of money, she your sweetheart, y'all doing things and all this stuff. When you broke, y'all start arguing even more. How I many of y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I'm telling you, you help me yeah, like develop me. Divorces. I will help unite yeah. African Americans in the diaspora, because that's part of development week. We will work on the health care, because that's part of development week. We will work on our relationships, because that's part of development week. I'm telling you, jobs and contracts, I'm telling you. But until you get on top of your money, it's gonna be real ugly. It's gonna be hard to concentrate on the things you need to learn. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it kind of supplements what you said about um, you know lack of money. Having a lack of resources in general, um, you know, contributes to the lack of motivation. Um, I know a lot of friends that you know are in gangs and hoods and stuff, and you know, talented people. You know, talented, they're, either they they're talented. really good at like really good literary expertise yeah. or you know some, I have a friend who 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 is in a gang and he draws like really well with yeah. pen, you wow. know and I'm like how come you didn't pursue that yeah. and he's like it just school just doesn't interest me I, yeah. I got a kid and I need to yeah. find ways to get around right. it you know and, and sometimes the lack of resources becomes an excuse yeah. you know? yeah. um, and, and it's crazy because you know I was saying we have these resources such as like yeah. you have information everywhere that you can obtain, but sometimes people don't have access to a, a computer. Yep, yep. Who else? Who's next? Do you still have a question? Um, so, man, just a comment. Um, I, I like what you said about um, us black people we do to ourselves. Um, I hate saying I'm from Anchorage. Yeah. Um, I really hate saying it. The reason yeah. being is because I always. I always think back of the times I had, and I always feel like from everybody. And like, even if I have a relationship with somebody here, mm -hmm. if I feel like it's, it's just a little off, I'll be like, I'll be like forget everybody, you know? And uh, it's because they sugarcoated what being black was. Yeah. You know, it was very TV to me. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I want to say is, is a lot of people that are, are younger than me, or, or my age, it doesn't look attractive. Or it looks like it's just repeating history. You know, maybe us as, as us being younger, maybe we could do something that they know it's it's the movement is new. You know, that we're keeping alive. What's been told to us, what we should be doing. I mean, it's a time now where we're available to really do what they've been asking us to do. But you know, that's that's just you know. <laughs> some I, I, I know and I, under, I understand that and but I just feel like some and some of the people that I see talk a lot about how they're discriminated against or with the cops or whatever and it's very true but this this is nothing new and I just I, and I and, may, and maybe I don't expect everybody to have that same fire in me but to the fact that Harriet Tubman was a slave 
and and still manage to get free and then go back and get others free like to me i'm just i just all i gotta do is finish, finish what she started for yeah. me. so yeah. the fact that that doesn't set the flame and everybody else i got me don't even know here to tell me who's next thank you <laughs> I got, I got men that don't even know they're in high school. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about Yes. So what are we going to do about Hollywood? Hollywood yeah, teaching us. And so what are we going to do about Hollywood? Non teaching. Uh, so what do you have in mind? Which is Lincoln. Uh -huh. Huh? Lincoln. Yeah, left out the African Americans in Oh, they certainly did. Well, Lincoln, Our first word was Where's Frederick? Yeah. Where's Frederick Douglass? Yeah. And you know, if you go back in Hollywood, I mean, just think about it. When does Denzel Washington get his Oscar? When he plays a gangster. When does Holly, when does Holly Berry get an Oscar? When she goes nude and has one of her longest sex scenes and she plays a woman whose husband or boyfriend, whatever, is getting executed with the black man worth the thing. It's powerful. And then when you go back, when was the last time a black person got an Oscar? When they played a maid back in Gone with the Wind. I think somebody else might have been nominated as sister. So Hollywood is making a point. We like you playing gangsters. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. We like you playing hoes mm -hmm. and all that. So what do you do about that? Well, it's, go it's not going to be easy changing that, but I'm going to tell you this much. In this world, you got to get yourself together. That's all I'm saying. Or nobody's going to tell your story right. Mm -hmm. In this world, you got to get yourself together. Nobody's gonna, they might pick you up a little, now they might push you in the hole, but they pushed you so fast and quick, it's hard to prove, and you no know, they didn't, they got selected, I don't think, I, I'm not the kind of person that would push you, and I don't even have arms, it's just great. You're like, I can't push me. But some of them will pick you up and take you out that hole, but they will not bring you on top of that mountain. That's prosperity, no one will do that. And the truth of the matter is, you ain't bringing up other people from other ethnicities to the top of the mountain either. You're trying to help yourself and some people look like you. You have to bring yourself up there. You need a plan as to how you're going to do it. When you start fixing those things, just like Jewish Americans, you start telling your story, fixing stuff, now everything starts coming to you. Now a lot of stuff gets easier. And that's what's left for us. The good news is, just as Jeffrey would say, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey Cooney, City University of New York, we're on a victorious path. You gotta look at it in big, the big picture. A hundred years ago, where were we? That would have been 19, what, 13. We're still in the bowels of segregation. A hundred years before that, where were you? 1813, you were in the bowels of slavery. But we're getting better. It just doesn't feel like it. It's so slow. But we are on a victorious path. But you gotta help your <laughs> so, you gotta help yourself. You gotta learn this stuff. Who else? Okay. Who else? Anybody? Uh, no, I was why we've had this disparity. It will only make sense when you learn this history. If you, if, you, if you come to this question, apart from the history, you'll go, well, there's all this opportunity. Obviously, the reason why these people are not following along educationally is because they don't care about learning. And actually, some white people, they will tell you that too. They will tell you that, uh, you know, there is racism, but it's just isolated instances. And so really, the reason why you where you are is because you're not exercising merit, either because you don't know or because you're not working hard enough. And now, on Fox News, there are black people that say that. They pay them. They get paid well. <laughs> yep. They get paid well. So, but if you go and look at the history, what you're going to find is that there is a, there, there's a large core of African Americans, the masses, that they've really never had programming for. That, that, that are living in a skewed existence that slides, it keeps them from, from rising high. 
the the extraordinary ones, the, the, the ones that are so determined, make it out. And they use them to say, see, you can do it. But it is so hard to make it that they know it slides you back down. And many of them want it like that because they want to be at the top. They want to have more of their share of the resources than the numbers, their numbers would suggest is fair. And they feel that we don't really want this black mass anyway. We didn't, they didn't want us in the north. So that's why they set us up in the central area. And when we were in the central area, we had to be in the central area. When we were in the Rainier, that little core, Rainier Valley, we had to be there. They took big houses and broke them up into four plexes. And they said, you better be here. Go back to Massey's work on housing discrimination. That's how you can make sense of what happened in the last 100 years. You follow the housing discrimination. The apartments were a, a, a single family, little raggedy place was being rented out at about the same amount as a more decent place in Ballard. But in the 60s, you couldn't be in Ballard. Even in West Seattle was hard. We found um, discriminatory language on stuff in the 1980s from in that U District area, Sand Point area, where they just simply said, no Jews or blacks. Those were the things they had in place. Then they brought the police around that and said, don't go out of here. The jobs left those areas. So now you gotta go through police on some bus somewhere to try to get a job somewhere. And they didn't really want you. You're the least demanded labor. So you, we, we can do the studies person for person. Same degree, same age, same school we went to, same everything. We already know from these studies. It is more likely that the white is going to get the job. So they face that. Their schooling is not as good because they don't get as many resources. So they. So at every rung, they're a little bit behind. When that's happening to you, and you graduate, a little bit harder to get to school, a little bit harder to get married. Because you don't look like you've got that much to offer. But you still don't have sex. She's like, hey, I don't want to marry you, but we could go out and kick it. So the lady might have a baby, and they're going to be born in the same situation you in, or maybe a little bit worse. You're gonna be an absentee father trying to raise the kid, and it just perpetuates itself. Now the state of Washington has the dubious distinction of being one of the most incarcerated African-American communities on the globe. Mm -hmm. Incarcerated at a rate two times worse the blacks here than Mississippi's, and you can't get white people to care about that. I speak on that whenever I'm on a judicial selection committee. I make the judges. I make them deal with those facts. And they usually go, I didn't know that. Are you, I have to look into that. You know, that's really something. And they do nothing about it. Because they believe if you're committing that kind of crime, it's because you're criminal. They don't want to talk about profiling. They don't want to talk about the uh, dragnet policing. They don't want to talk about the lost economic opportunities, which drive you to want to hustle. 